Hello, everybody in front of the screens. And hi, Emilia, Emilia Roac. Um, I'm so glad to see you again. I'm so glad to see you too. Um, yeah, you are the author of Why We Matter. And I was uh, fortunate and lucky enough to um, uh, to host the premiere of your book. And this is where we talked first. Um, Yes, the book uh, is out since um, 2021, beginning it was March, right? February, February. 15th of February. 15th mm -hmm. of February. Time is blurry in times of an epidemic, I think. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but since then, it has uh, become a best-selling book. And you talk about um, intersectionality, about identity. And this is what we are going to do today. We're talking about identities, mm -hmm. I would say. And so you're Alice, yes. Alice Hastas, and you're also the author of a very best-selling book, <laughs> um, which came out in 2019 mm -hmm. at Hansa Blau Verlag. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also talks about racism, about yes. identity and about um, whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the title is uh, what white people should know about racism, but don't want to hear. Exactly. And, um, and I'm going to start the conversation with a a question that mm. has to do with identity and that also has to do with whiteness yes um and with blackness but yeah. mo more with whiteness i would say and that's the term mm. afropean mm -hmm. um do you identify with it mm -hmm. do you feel like an afropean i think it's interesting that you th say that it has more to do with whiteness than uh, blackness but um i would say i never use this term to describe myself But if somebody would describe me as Afropean, I would say it's accurate. I wouldn't stand back or say, no, I'm not, because, yeah, I think I am an Afropean, but this is not a part of, of a self-identification for me. I see Afropean as um, uh, the black diaspora living in Europe. I think these people are Afropean <coughs> to me. But what about you? Well, you know, first of all, what came to my mind is that we don't say um, white European, you know, and of mm. course, because, you know, I think, I mean, of course, European people originally um, were white and it's not the same as, you know, mm. uh, American, right? Because American originally they were not white mm -hmm. you know the only real americans in in inverted mm -hmm. commas are uh, native americans yeah and so that's why i understand it better why mm -hmm. we would talk about afropeans here in europe and i think it's about highlighting the black identity that is inherently part of europe and that has been negated okay. because when we look at italy spain portugal france germany mm -hmm. we see whiteness we see white bodies yeah. and black bodies in europe have been erased they've been created as other as not belonging as you know um colluded to another geographical area and so i think that the term is helping us invest europe and invest the european identity so It's not intuitive for me, you know, like mm. if you ask me, so how do you identify? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm an Afropean. I mm -hmm. think it's a term that yet needs to arrive and that yet needs to, you know, come to our um, self-perception and, uh, and expand in that sense. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of gifts in it, in a sense, um, because it can bring visibility and it can also, um, yeah, add blackness to the European racial landscape. Definitely. I think also um, there's just, we n nobody has just one identity. And I just I think it's always interesting if somebody offers me a name for another, how I can frame my identity, in which context I can see it. And um, I absolutely um, think that we need a word to describe a black experience in Europe since um, there is actually a conversation about a European identity, but of course um, the black experience is because we imagine Europe as white and Europe is always told as a, the, you know, the continent of white people. Um, I think it's very uh, helpful to, um, as you said, to uh, diversify and actually make it visible um, that black people are also part of the European continent. And also, I just read an article um, that was talking about 
uh, how the origin story of uh, Europe is so um, has erased um, people of color, black people that have been, especially in s the south of Europe, have always been part of uh, European societies. So um, that was just um, that was ju I was just thinking about that because I think it's also wrong um, to think about or you could question that the term European is so synonym synonymous with um, whiteness, right? Yeah. Since it's actually a myth, <coughs> but it's a myth that it has been around for so long that you might need a word to counterpart this. But that's answer. that's what supremacy. That's what white supremacy is doing, right? Mm -hmm. It's just creating this. Um, overbearing universal racial norm you mm -hmm. know that the u.s is white right mm -hmm. if you have an image of who's an american then you automatically have a white american person yeah even though demographically um you know white people are soon to be in the minority you know or at least um the way we we, we frame whiteness and that's the same with um, that's the same with Europe, I would say. Yeah, definitely, even more, I think. Yeah, even oh, so much more. Yeah, so much more. But also, you know, there are um, new works being done about Germany and about mm. the history of black people in Germany that shows, you know, black people have always been there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's the same with France, you know, with France's colonial history and past and present. Uh, we cannot talk about a white France and, and that's still what's prevailing. So when mm. we say, okay, we want to have uh, liberty, equality and fraternity, then mm. it's, it's all in whiteness. Definitely. Um, and, when, and, and, and I like that you talked about the various identities because, of course, you know, while the term intersectionality can help us understand this, and intersectionality basically tells us that our identities are, are multifaceted, but it's not mm. so much about the individual and about the individual experience, but so much more about um, what are the systems of oppression that are impacting us? Exactly. What types of identities are projected onto us by society? Mm -hmm. And all of those identities are constructed, right? Because we see that there are no human races, biologically speaking. Yeah. Um, those races were constructed, but yet they still have a very strong impact. It means that even if our DNA um, says, a l says little about our skin color and how we were constructed, we will still navigate the world um, with our skin color and will be perceived differently by um, police officers on the street, mm. by uh, immigration officers, by you know the person at the grocery store, uh, the person we want to rent the apartment from. Yeah. And so that's why um, I feel like it's important if we want to dismantle the idea of race, if we want to dismantle um, racism as a system to recognize the tremendous impact that it ha that it ha <laughs> sorry mm. <laughs> that it has had on us and mm. um, uh, and in that sense that's why like I mean to circle back to Afropean I think it's a term that I want to embrace I mean I'm, I, mm. I don't want to put it in the forefront of who I am because I identify as many different other things but I think it can be helpful to to give um, space to this. Yeah. Mm. Now, as we go on talking about this, I'm just thinking about that, you know, we talked about how whiteness is like Europe um, and whiteness is so connected in our brains, as is Africa and blackness. And of course, also on the African continent, it is more complex than there's just one thing. <coughs> um, and now Afropean connects these two continents in a word, but it connects also these two perceptions of race, maybe, mm -hmm. or it, it makes them blend together. And I, I think there is actually, it can be helpful, it can also be tricky, because, um, because y you always, you still you manifest that um, blackness is part of like blackness is in Africa and whiteness is in Europe mm -hmm. also with that maybe I'm yeah. not sure I'm just thinking about this as I'm talking <laughs> um, yeah so I don't know of course there would be people if we would actually come to the um, 
to that place where it's really established to talk about Afropeans, I'm sure there would be some, you know, South African, white South African person living in Sweden who would say, I am Afropean as well, yeah. <laughs> you know, that because, uh, yeah. you know, that mm. there was always this conflict about like location versus race and mm. stuff. So, so we had talked about, you know, when we had a chat yesterday, mm. just uh, talking about how we were going to, you know, run this conversation. And so it might mm. seem like a breach, but I think. You know, we need to bring our histories as well um, to our identities and also to the themes that we're talking about. And yeah. so both of us are speaking a lot about racism here in Germany. Yeah. We're just um, being very present in the discourse. And I just wanted to talk about that, too. You yeah. know, like, how does it feel to be an Afropean here in Germany yeah. talking about racism? And what does it do to yourself and to... Um, you know, to, to have to deal with all this resistance be because currently this is what we see. We see a tremendous backlash against liberation movements, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. liberation movements which are currently framed as identity politics. Mm -hmm, yes. And uh, I've decided for myself to not speak about identity politics anymore, but to mm. speak about liberation movements because this is really what's at stake. What yeah. we want is liberation from oppressive patterns, from oppressive systems mm -hmm. based on an identity, of course. Right. And uh, I feel like it's more difficult to attack liberation movements rather than attacking identity politics. Definitely. I think uh, language and terminology and um, around um, the discussion and the discourse about race, social justice, all intersectionality is so interesting because I um, feel the same way. I think it's really unfortunate that I have to let go of the term identity politics because it's so... It, the origin of identity politics comes from the Cumbie River Collective, a mm -hmm. um, queer feminist black organization in the U.S. Uh, during the 70s. And what they intended with the term um, identity politics was actually something that I think is very beautiful, that they thought... So powerful, yeah. And very powerful, <coughs> exactly. And now... Um, people in total disregard of the origin and legacy of the word identity politics and the people who created this term um, actually twisted it in something that um, is supposed to be um, destructive, but it's not. But so you have to change, you have to let go. Like it, mm -hmm. it, I feel like this term is like somebody like grabbed this term and I have to let it I have yeah, to let go it's, of it's it. misappropriation. That's yeah. a, that's a very colonial um, pattern that is at play here of dominance yeah. as well, of white yeah. dominance. And um, what I see is that, you know, of course, it came from the Kambahi River Collective. That mm. was like um, the stance that they were adopting was to reclaim their humanity, to reclaim their rights, to reclaim respect mm. um, and visibility. Right. Yeah. And what we see is that. The whole backlash against identity politics is rooted in fear, mm -hmm. and this fear is to lose power, to give space to other people, to let go of oppression. Yeah. And so what happened was, um, and, and, and here I want to quote Bell Hooks because she says, uh, sometimes people want to destroy you, not mm -hmm. because they... Um, hate you, or I can't remember exactly the, the quote, mm -hmm. but they want to destroy you because they feel and they see your power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They see your force. They see your strength. Yeah. And this is exactly what's happening because it's at a time where identity politics was becoming stronger, where the claims of people of color and other minoritized groups were becoming more articulated, mm -hmm. more organized, more visible in the mainstream media that this backlash occurred. Yeah. So, you know, instead of looking at the argument against it which to me are excuses mm -hmm. they are not rooted in any rational thinking yeah. they are the expression of um, white superiority of mm -hmm. white supremacy and they basically say you don't get to speak for yourself you don't get to define yourself we get to be on top mm -hmm. don't touch this hierarchy don't touch this power of yeah. definition that we have over you and so I think it's our job to really reclaim this discourse and to unveil the wrong uh, rhetorics that is behind it, to unveil this hypocrisy mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and to say you don't have a problem with identities because look our world is organized along identity lines yeah. you know our world is based on this you cannot have a problem with this this is a, this is this is a hypocritical um argument that you're yeah. bringing right what you don't want is our liberation and so mm. we need to call it by its name yeah yeah <coughs> i think it's very um uh, very smart and uh, very a very good term to call it, uh, liberation movements because that is actually that is what is um what people are trying not to talk about or distract from is what the purpose of this discourse is so to mm-hmm. put the purpose in the in the name of what we're doing is actually very um, helpful. So I will follow after you and call it liberation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you now. know, like at some point, um, the liberation, there is an attempt to kill this liberation. Mm-hmm. There's an attempt to um, to weaken it constantly, right? So it's can, it can be through words, it can mm-hmm. be through gaslighting, you know, by yeah. saying, This not we're not we're not oppressing you. You are oppressing us. Yes. You are oppressing us by preventing us from being free. Yeah. Uh, and you know we should understand from being oppressive. Mm-hmm. You are preventing us from it. So therefore, you are doing the oppressing. Yeah. And um, again, I mean, I like quotes. You will mm-hmm. notice that. And also in my books, there are a lot of quotes. But Malcolm X said that about the media. Mm-hmm. And that's really what can happen, you know, mm-hmm. in, a, in a process where power um, is so inequitably distributed that there's one perspective that is prevailing and one perspective that is seen as universal, neutral, objective, rational, and the other one that is seen as emotional, as biased, as subjective. And he says... The media, be careful of the media, because if you're not paying attention, if you're not careful, mm-hmm. it will make the um, it will make the, the, the criminal look or, or it will make the oppressed look like the criminal mm-hmm. and the criminal look like. Sorry, no, I yeah, don't have you, right, but yeah, twisting like it reversing, around. twisting yeah. it, you know, and mm-hmm. making the victim like look like the perpetrator and vice versa. Yeah. And um, I think it's important to look it up to, to have it right. I mean, I have it in the book again, but uh, and we have to be careful because this is what's happening right now. We don't have an anchorage in in historical facts. We don't have an anchorage in in reality, even if you know there is no single reality. There is mm-hmm. a multiplicity of realities, but it's also important to mention that something's happened. You know, like. Slavery happened. Yeah. Jim Crow happened. The colonization happened here on, you know, in, in Europe. Um, the Shoah happened. The Poramos happened. Yeah. You know, we need to know that. Stonewall and, you know, the, the segregation of um, people with disabilities happened. And so these are facts that we need to encore in our discourses, in our thinking, to just not make it look like we're just speaking about, me, you know, trivial um aspects of our identity exactly because that's what they um or they or that's what a lot of people uh, want to make it seem like that this is a that these things are trivial and that these things are not really important and yeah. that these things are just that we discuss these things just because we are bored and we are in need of attention and mm-hmm. this is um this is so oppressive this is very this is cruel. abusive and i also <laughs> think this is gaslighting actually and this um uh this talk about um, telling the people and I want to know how you personally feel about this as a person being visible and talking about these issues because we always um, you said our side the side of uh, liberation movements is also framed as emotional irrational uh, biased and the other side is the one who wants rationality and stuff now also and I think but the way they bring their argument forward is so emotional. They say, "It is. I am framed <coughs> as a white man. This is like you are. This is. I feel so offended. This is highly emotional. The way they argue is highly emotional. And I also, I have the feeling that I am not able to express my anger um, or my 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 feelings of oppression." Because they, their response is so emotional. So uh, we are always found to be the mm-hmm. very rational, calm uh, people who always, who are never thrown off. And yeah. I think that is 
it's just turning up against, against us, self. right? Because yeah. we have reasons to be angry. We have reasons yeah. to be frustrated, to feel attacked because we are attacked. They're mm. not attacked, yeah. right? And so that's why, you know, sometimes when I look at what it does to me also physically, you know, this is so much, so much, so many emotions turning against myself, you know, like mm. I was, um, I, I was doing a, the recording for a, a, a talk show and at some point I was feeling really angry because some, for me, unacceptable things were said. And then I had this little voice saying, oh my God, am I just, you know, crossing the line? Mm -hmm. Am I crossing the line of the acceptable in yeah. my position? Yeah, you know, yeah. like a white man can be angry on a TV show and that's fine. Yeah, he will yeah. not be, you know, he, it will not be against him. I mm -hmm. mean, look at Donald Trump. Yeah, How yeah. many times has he shown like an acceptable anger yeah. and it was still fine. You know, and not just Donald Trump, you know, I'm speaking about him, but it's like, mm. Uh, but he is symbolic of uh, he's very uh, symbolic uh, of this like white male privilege of being able mm. to just feel and like express anger and emotions and mm. not being turned against them yeah while you know for people who don't belong to that invis invisible powerful um norm that has been constructed as superior rational universal etc we are in constant check like looking at okay to what extent can i be myself to what mm. extent can i express what I want to express, what needs to come out of my body, yeah. you know, before I am cast as somebody that shouldn't be listened to, you know, yeah, yeah. cast as somebody who is like too much, too aggressive, um, not comprom you know, not compromising enough. Mm. Also this injunction of compromise, we have to compromise all the time. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that is asked of us, but not of, you know, people in dominant groups. Yeah. I really feel conflicted with, um, you just, um, describe the conflict perfectly and the, the power dynamics um, within this discourse and I also feel very conflicted and I feel like this is um, taking a toll on me to be the person who is always calm and rational mm. to also to um, also prevent a narrative that is already in the room before I enter it being the irrational person and I also have to like <coughs> over perform this rationality yeah. and calmness and I think even though the stakes that I am entering the discourse uh, from are really a lot higher because we are talking about oppression lives that are being threatened this is this is uh, we are talking about the need of liberation mm -hmm. and the other side is talking about um, giving up power or ent like having no, it's, the it's possibility of multiple perspectives on I exactly no, you're right it's like it's giving up power but sometimes it's just as well like accepting others mm -hmm. seeing the humanity of others seeing that other people have perspectives that they have emotions that they mm -hmm. have an existence and that this existence that they are in control of that existence yeah this is what is so triggering for yeah. people who've b had the power in our society so far mm -hmm. is to accept that yes i mean people can be um the masters of themselves like to speak in colonial slavery like mm. terms because i think this is also what it is yeah mm. so to wrap it up i think um the term because we are not alone in this um conversation i'm so glad that uh that you know, I know that you are there. There are so many people there talking about this, these issues from different perspectives, bringing their perspectives forward and helping um, to liberate us, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what that term Afropean can do is actually to connect these struggles further um, out of Germany into the European context because these co uh, conversations are going on um, everywhere everywhere um, yeah. also on the european continent and i think to have a unifying um term um that we can rally behind and uh, see african also as part of uh, a term to liberate us could be actually nice so yeah, yeah. no absolutely Alice, like always, it was wonderful it speaking was wonderful. with you. It was way too short. It was, <laughs> it was way too, too short. short. Like we could have talked. There are so many other topics that I wanted to speak with you about, yeah. and that's uh, mental health. Yeah. 
and you know how to navigate these discourses and also being visible and i mean not I mean, visible mm. in the in the widest sense, like yeah. um, putting ourselves out there, basically yeah. Yeah, making yeah. ourselves vulnerable. What does it mean? And also, um, yeah, mainly this is this is a topic that we yet have to cover. But next uh, time, next time, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you so much for thank you that nice conversation with you. Thank you. <laughs>